one. All right. Hello, and welcome to Roll Call. All right, making sure we're updated. I'm also a little bit off center, so I'm going to scooch <laughs> this way. I am your host for this afternoon, Kayla McNabb. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, today, we're here to talk about our session from a few weeks ago on the 26th of March, uh, where we had our intrepid adventurers uh, traveling through uh, the levels of hell uh, in a one shot based on Dante's Inferno. So thank you for being here with us. And we hope that you watched that session. Um, you could still enjoy this chat, even if you didn't. But if you'd like to, uh, it is on our Twitch channel and it will be on our YouTube channel, which you can find by going to the about section on Twitch. All right. So I'll start by having each of our, our players and our game master from this session introduce themselves um, and share their pronouns as well, and then uh, give you a sense of what their job is at Virginia Tech um, and give the name of their character. We'll get into more about their characters later. Uh, so let's start with Alice. Hi, everyone. My name is Alice Rogers, and I am manager of the Media Design Studios at Virginia Tech. Uh, I, so I manage equipment lending as well as a small recording space. I played, uh, my pronouns are she, her. I played Athene Weatherby, who is a halfling paladin. Um, and I also, I guess, roughly played, uh, her, her, uh, Mount Orion, the blink dog. I mean, exceptionally is probably the, the word I would use. Maybe my favorite character. I mean, you all did a great it's, job. It's but just because it's a enjoy dog, a blink right? Dog. Like that's the yeah, reason. Yeah, we know. <laughs> it was also very sassy. He was. Um, yeah. Let's see here. I'm gonna go around in the order that we're on Twitch. So Kira will be next. Sure. Hi all. My name is Kira Dietz. I'm the assistant director of Special Collections and University Archives. I use she, her pronouns, and I had to remember before the stream, I was like, who did I even play? Um, but I played uh, Rena Dusk Arrow, a cleric of the knowledge domain. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Anthony. Uh, yeah, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez. I am the community collections archivist in Special Collections and University Archives. I use he and they pronouns, and I played... Uh, Tiberinos, a Goliath wizard um, who was from the Order of Scribes uh, as the subclass there. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And our game master, uh, Jonathan Bradley. Yeah, well, I'm Jonathan Bradley. I'm head of studios and innovative technologies for the university libraries. Uh, I was the game master. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and I was the one that sent them all to hell for funsies. Also Volo. Also Volo. <laughs> also Volo. Also for funsies. <laughs> Potentially everyone's least and most favorite Whoa. NPC. Most? Uh, <laughs> any, any other thoughts on least or most uh, favorite NPC? I mean, from my perspective, he was mm -hmm. the favorite. Because I got to play him like... That's, I assumed yeah, so. Because you got to play him like a jerk. <laughs> I mean, Volo's Volo. When you, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, oh no, this is what he's going to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it, I guess, it tracks. Yeah. So for context, I guess, like yes. yeah. the reason why it was Volo um, is I was trying, at that point in the thought process, I was trying to figure out who the Dante would be. Like, who are you going to rescue? And at first I was just like, it's just going to be some bard named Dante. And then I was like thinking about Dante in the book and how he's whiny and annoying and not really very heroic as a character, which is on purpose. <laughs> but I was like, you know, he reminds me of Volo, who's shown up in a personal campaign that I play in. And I was like, oh, great. That'd be a great way to get some laughs for my own purposes is to just make it that you're going after Volo. And he kind of fit like Volo is a scholar. He's a, he writes books, he adventures. Like those are all part of who he is as far as the forgotten realms go. 
So, like, it, it worked, and I got a lot of laughs out of it. And isn't that how you make all your decisions as a GM is what's going to make you laugh? <laughs> Well, I mean, ultimately, I appreciated it a lot because it was like it was really fun to play with because knowing sort of how Volo can be played and, and how I've encountered him in other games and how you played it. I was like, oh, I know exactly how to manipulate this character. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, he's in. I don't I mean, I've I've only played Waterdeep in terms of like Dungeons and Dragons, like fifth edition campaigns. He's in a number, though, right? He's in like not just Waterdeep. Right. Yeah. I don't he know. shows up periodically. Yeah. At least references, yeah, to to him. But um, yeah, he is definitely very present in the early stages of the Waterdeep Dragon Heist. So. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies for my non blink dogs barking and, then, and growling at each other in the background. They're currently. You could have told us they were blink. Uh, maybe dogs. they are blink dogs. Uh, <laughs> they are currently. Um, Playing tug of war with some of my clothing, which is fine. That's fine. That just happens sometimes. <laughs> oh, man. Hmm. We any... jumped all the way to NPCs. We gotta like back this train up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could do it in any order. We're gonna mix it up a little bit, you know. Um, we did get a little bit into the kind of how this adventure was put together. Um, in, in Jonathan's description of Volo. Uh, for folks who may not be familiar with Dante's Inferno, do you want to give us a bit of an overview of uh, the story and then kind of where it fits in historically? Sure. So Dante's... Like, no more than five minutes, oh, though. no. You know. She's going to start a <laughs> not, time not. Right? <laughs> Not the whole, you know. Okay. I mean, I know this is a story that you wow. taught as a I did. I did. as a professor of English. I did, I so, did used to teach this story. You know. um, so Dante's Inferno is the first part of a trilogy of poetry, epic poetry. That's a specific type of poetry. Um, and it is details the poet writing about himself. His, he starts the poem Lost in His Life and finds himself in a dark wood. It's very popular lines from the book, and you'll see it show up in uh, all kinds of media, like Patch Adams. Um, beginning of Patch Adams starts with that quote from Dante's Inferno. Um, hmm. He is then led by the poet Virgil, who wrote the Aeneid, uh, was a famous Roman poet, um, through hell. Uh, then he goes to Purgatory in the second book, Purgatorio, and then he goes to heaven in Paradiso. And for the record, most people don't read the second and third books. Uh, the first one is really the one that has. So here's the weird thing about Dante's Inferno. It seems like he's here to tell this epic story, but really it's sort of his chance to be petty and pick at people that he didn't like in real life. Um, like there's so much of the book that is, and, and it did come through in my design of the story, but so much of the poetry is designed to be a political statement about the current world. Like he does do more than that. It is not just that, but particularly Inferno is so much about like who he meets and why he thinks they deserve to be in hell. Um, like he's and a lot, like there's one scene where he finds somebody and it's somebody who's still alive during his time and he makes the excuse that they were so bad that demons came and took him and replaced him with like a mock human being because this was the worst person ever. Like that's the sort of thing that you get from from Dante in So it, it's it is it's kind of political commentary, um similar to like Gilbert and Sullivan, how that was all political commentary. Yeah. Well, I mean there's more and and so I will say it is a hugely influent like and it is hard to underestimate its influence. Like modern conception of hell as it's depicted in almost all media is ties back to two books, Dante's Inferno and John Milton's Paradise Lost. Like Paradise Lost. Yep. It, even if you look at like religious like texts, there the the what hell is is very sparsely discussed. And there's really no details. Like this idea of like demons with pitchforks and lakes of burning fire and, and all like all this sort of stuff that's very common in modern depictions of hell, they come from these books because that sort of level of detail just does not exist in the 
its texts. There's references here and there to things like Hell is Golgotha, which was skulls, a reference to where Christ went. There's Hell is the Grave is a, a direct statement. There is Hell is a like a lake of fire. It's a simile, but it's been taken literally, and it's one of the things that Dante took like literally when it came to like describing this. So like there are these sort of very concise references in religious texts, but the imagery and this what has so much become the consciousness of what hell is like comes from these two books. And that's a good kind of transition into exposure to this work previously, right? Like, had any of our players read Dante's Inferno? No. Yes. A portion, not all of it. <laughs> and also, like, I feel like I know in in the original Italian, right, it's in rhyming triplets. And I feel like I just have a feeling that, like, reading it in actual rhyming triplets would make it a lot more interesting, if nothing else. I don't know, maybe not. Maybe reading it translated is... Um, but, like, I feel like that's, like, one of those things where it's, like, rhyming triplets. Who does that? That's insane. Well, you he's know? known for, I'm pretty sure he's known for being <laughs> yeah. the first Italian poet to do that. Like, that's a style that he yeah. he's known as, like, the first. Yeah, and I think, it's a long work, you know? I think my... I have a really... Oh, go ahead. I, I think my only <laughs> exposure uh, previously was through, like, fine art or, honestly, through mm -hmm. the D&D &D, um, setting of the Nine Hells or, like, depictions in, in media. I've never... It, it's never been something that I particularly was very interested in actually reading. Um, so I I was excited to play the game, but I also was like, how much of this do I know? And then um, in some ways it felt very similar to uh, the Piers Anthony um, Incarnations of Immortality novel, When They Go to Hell. Uh, there's a series of like seven or eight I think it's eight books mm. um and the second to last one is the devil and tons of stuff about like hell and the motivations of the devil and stuff like that and so for me it it resonated with that work which i have read um that is clearly based on uh this sure. in some way yeah uh, I'm one of those people that actually has read the entire work. I've actually read the entire work more than once. Yay, lit majors. Yep. Um, <laughs> Same here. Uh, in, tran in translation, but to Alice's point, I actually have an edition um, because I also spent some time in high school and college studying Latin. I actually have an edition that is the Italian on one page and the English on the other. Ooh. I am by no means fluent in Italian, but I can pick a lot of it out. So it's really, that's a really, that was a really fun way for me to read it at a point in time where I was more fluent in Latin. Um, and I very briefly toyed with playing a bard, basically, so I could quote the Inferno back within the context of the game. <laughs> but I was too far removed from having read it, and I didn't really have time to put together, like, a little pocket list of quotes to pull out. <laughs> Although I really <laughs> wanted to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I read it first oh, when nice. I was 17, and I wrote one of my high school English lit papers on it. It was not assigned um, I didn't like the book that was assigned, so I asked my teacher if I could read it instead, and she was like, sure. Nice. Yeah, if you want to go, if you want to be extra, be extra. Um, that's fine. Go read Dante's and Wait, what was, the book, what was the book that was assigned? <laughs> I, that's a good question. I don't remember. The Crucible, I think. <laughs> Ooh, good mm. choice. You made a I good choice. I think that's choice. a good choice. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go with that. Um, Shading the Crucible. Nice. Yeah, it is. It is a. It's not a book that you expect. It like Alice is right. It is a long poem. Like it is a lot longer mm -hmm. than you would think. And and Kira, I may actually have the same edition of the book that you have because I also have a version that has mm -hmm. English on one side and Italian on the other. Um, yeah. And Dante was known because partially he wrote the Divine Comedy in Italian, and that was not a thing you normally did during that time. You normally wrote everything in Latin, and that was a big deal. Um, that he had done that. Um, so there's also some controversy about that. But it, it is a book that's like... I When I came time to convert it, I was like, this is way too much content. 
Like, <laughs> um, I knew, so I knew from the beginning that like, this was a good option for like a one shot because it is one, it is heavily influenced the Faerunian like, um, plane system that exists in D and D. So, I mean, it's basically, you could plug and play. Um, but two, like it's built in, it's an, it's a trip to hell and back. Like that's the stuff of heroes and stories and all this sort of stuff that tabletop role playing game known for but it was actually so i put it on there and originally i had thought well they'll be dante like the players will be dante they'll they'll we'll send them to hell somehow and they'll have to get out and when it came time to actually like sit down and think about how to convert this um i got stuck on that a lot because dante in the poem is not a hero like he is, he is whiny. He faints all the time. Like big sections of the story are missing because he was fainting during that time. He just wakes up later. They're like, oh yeah, we went down a couple layers. Like while you were out, I carried you. Um, and so I started thinking about it and I was like, I don't know how. And the other side of it is like a big part of it is who Dante meets in hell. And that they are tied to him in some fashion and that he wants to interact with them and going into it with players and multiple players and the challenges of that, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to be able to, to tie in that theme with like pulling something meaningful for each of you that is, makes sense with your character backstories, especially when I probably won't know your character backstories until like right up until the thing's supposed to start. (laughs) And so it was then that I sort of stopped and I was like, well, who is the hero? If you, if there is a hero in Dante's Inferno. And I was like, it's kind of Virgil. Like Virgil's the one who confronts all of the obstacles. Like whenever a demon is like, you can't pass through here. Virgil's the one that's like, I'll go talk to him. Hold up. Um, and Dante sits around and like looks at people and whines about who he doesn't like or something like that. I'm not depicting him particularly well, but I think it's fair. Uh, I mean, Dante I mean, buys. I just want to excerpt that quote. I just want to, it's it's Universal's the one that goes up. The, Hold up, I'll get yeah, this. Got this. <laughs> but in Italian triplets, it sounds very much like Bolo in our adventure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, and and I mean, like Dante gets in fist fights with people he meets in hell and stuff, and um, like gets in these like heated arguments for it, and that was part of the fun for me because I was like Bolo, one hundred percent. Like there would be people down mm-hmm. here that were like. Oh yeah, it's about time you ended up down here, uh, and then would get mad at them and stuff. And I was like, I mean, it fits like with some of the stuff that's going on in the book, but yeah, I was like, they have. And I think I, I really, I was gonna say, I really like that about your approach because as much as it's a political commentary and it's somewhat existential, it's also really funny at times, mm-hmm. and it's also like, and so, and it's really poignant at times, and it you know, makes you think about things at times. And I think that's a, like, those are great elements of a D and D game too. So by not making us all play Dante yeah. <laughs> and be passed out and whiny. Like we did. Yeah, that's fair. That's one of the biggest challenges is like figuring out in a work of literature, like what role y'all should play. So here's another fun fact about this. Literally the day before this was supposed to air and I had prepared it, I found out that a company was releasing a 5e Dante's Inferno book, like completely based on Dante's Inferno. I, I mean, I can look up like during the next like chance where other people are talking, I'll try to look up the name of it, but it was like a whole like thick, like hardbound book of just yeah. like an entire setting that's based on Dante's Inferno. And I was like, that would have been cool to have like, <laughs> like is three it the weeks nine hells based on Dante's Inferno? It is. So and so their approach is what I had ultimately mm-hmm. avoided. Theirs is that you are you are Dante, your lost souls is the way they depict it, and you're trying to like find your own way out of hell, the single exit to hell that exists. Um and so I don't know that it ultimately would have worked, but um yeah, it's they they've got like a whole system for like how you end up in hell, how you're getting out. The, the creatures you meet because like while the nine hells and 5e are based on Dante's Inferno a lot of the details are very um, and I had to change a lot about some of the devils and stuff that you meet just to sort of make them fit with like what Dante's is like the devils and in, in, in one there's also demons who are having their big war when it comes to D&D like the, the blood war as, as mm-hmm. it is like canonically known 
Like, so you always, if you're in the nine hells, you have chance to run into demons as well as devils. And there are no, like, they're all sort of devils as they're depicted in Dante's Inferno. And they are, they're based in a Christian mythos. And so they, they sort of kowtow to the power of like Virgil sites, like heavenly power has deemed that they can come through here. And they often back off because they fear that. The devils in like Dungeons and Dragons, that's not a thing. And so yeah. I that was a weird thing too, was like y'all were gonna be sent here by one of the Faerunian like deities, but the devils in Dungeons and Dragons aren't gonna care who you're here for. They're probably probably just make them happier and they're like, ha, we got so and so's like follower um on a pitchfork <laughs> or whatever. So like there was there was some like you know, places where just so much as a word of like, hey, we're allowed through here and there's nothing you can do about it gets them through in Dante's Inferno that I was like, now there's got to be more challenging for them. By the way, I think you're talking about, it looks like there was a Kickstarter started by Acheron books. Acheron. Yep, that's Acheron. Them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I mean, it, maybe it will make you feel better or less good, but um, I think it's not going to be released until December of this year. But so if we wanted to revisit in what maybe in the times when we can be in person, because it has a bunch of like physical components hey, too. We missed a lot of levels. Yeah. They have yeah. like, it looks like they have like a lot. maps and stuff. So um, yeah, it looks really cool. Um, the Kickstarter is over, but it looks really neat. So I'll, I'll post the link in the chats for folks to see if they're interested. Um, hashtag not sponsored, but you know, cool stuff <laughs> happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you gotta support other people doing cool stuff too. Uh, that's why we're yeah. here, because we're nerds. Uh, and we like nerdy things. Yeah. there. So we've talked about a few kind of, I guess, levels of engagement with the source material, right? But we've all had a lot of kind of passive engagement with this, like we've talked about, like, very obviously the nine hells is based on what came out of this the like jonathan was talking about just any time that someone shows you what it looks like in hell that really comes out of these couple of key points in the history of literature right are there things that you expected to find in hell that you didn't find there what were you looking forward to in hell, you know? <laughs> I think I think a lot of the elements that I remembered from Dante's Inferno, I remember like encounter like the river sticks and people being in the river um and sighing and complaining about everything. Um Hashtag don't go in the river. Yeah. That was a bad one. Oh my god. <laughs> reliving reliving um <laughs> the the last river situation that we encountered on roll of play um <laughs> that was that was the a open moment. boat yeah the open yeah. boat yeah. moment we gotta stay out of the water yeah. Um, yeah not good it was my time to fall in the water that's all i knew because i managed to mostly stay out of it in the open boat. <laughs> yeah i remember watching a a popular campaign where someone had plate armor on which i also did uh, my character did who like they gave him disadvantage for trying to get out of the boat which like or get out of the water which is totally fair like plate armor in in the water would not be a good time i don't think um so yeah i mean i was just like this is this is this could be death this could be bad i assume you know there would be something that would happen that maybe wouldn't have happened on the open boat where people just could have died because it's the open boat um here maybe i don't know if jonathan had a like get out of jail free card for that moment but um we all we all made it back in i mean I mostly <laughs> it, mostly the biggest danger there was you losing your memory like oh, y'all yeah. are capable enough that getting out and getting away from the people trying to pull you in like wouldn't you, you might struggle a little bit if you had some bad roles but you'd be able to get out but the, every time you got pulled under, it was another save against losing more. And every time it compounded what you lost, like the first time you lost potentially just like some very recent memories. But if you're under long enough, you you lose your entire. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't have any really specific yeah. things that I expected, um, having not read the book, but uh, generally just fire and demons, which I feel like we got. I'm very glad that we also moved on from the fire portion to the cold, freezing, like freezing <laughs> portion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that that happened and that we got to see more than just the fire, fiery demon part. Yeah. That was a that, not always something that people think about when they think about hell, but is is cano- clearly articulated. Yeah, is canonical yeah. in, in Dante's mm-hmm. Inferno. Um, so the final the final circle of hell is a frozen lake that Satan is trapped in. He is flapping his wings trying to release himself, and the air, cold air that comes from his wings freezes the lake around him and holds him ever tighter. And it's, you know, it's a great metaphor for like struggling against something that you can't is only making it worse sort of thing. But also it has like Judas in the water, me, right? Like you can look down and see Judas and like some specific like no, Judas is being the, chewed in his mouth. Oh, that's right. My bad. Judas, <laughs> Brutus and Cassius, the mm, three great betrayers right. of a rightful Lord are all there's some real cool art depictions and interpretations of Dante if you all are if people are interested in that yeah. go check it out there's some really there are there's some really interesting good, perspectives great plate um, <laughs> art etchings and stuff but so the ending I would argue to Dante's Inferno from if if you're looking at it from just like pure poetry from like medieval poetry is like shocking like oh he confronts Satan and he's a giant monster and he's chewing these but like from a from a modern like adventurer standpoint it's a little anticlimactic like they basically see him and they're like cool you can't do anything so we're just gonna like crawl literally they crawl on him like ants um and i was like that would be a boring way to end this so i went for the joke (laughs) of you running into asmodeus who is who's the equivalent in in dungeons and dragons and he's got his feet in a nice ice bath (laughs) which was just me because he was tired. Yeah, it seems seems like he's <laughs> he had a rough. It seems him. like he's had a rough day. I um, thoroughly enjoyed the temptations at the end. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was really glad that you you like showed interest because I was really worried that it would just be um, Volo, and mm, I was like, Volo. I really hope someone mm-hmm. else takes this bait. Uh, I'm a wizard. It'll be more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's true. I mean, <laughs> well, and we should mention the the fourth player that we had with us who was not here. Griffin was playing yes. a Warforged. Uh, who also was somewhat tempted, as I recall, mm-hmm. by by some mm-hmm. of the, the options. I think it's intrigued <laughs> in some ways, though also, like, very content in himself. So, like, you know, there was a lot of, like, I don't know. There was a very interesting circumstance. Well, we ended up going through part of the city of Brass, was it? Mm-hmm. The city of Dis. Mm-hmm. city of Dis. Yes. Um, but a, a metal city, and he was metal, and so an offhanded comment from my character <clears throat> about that he had come home or something like that um, stuck with his character, and his character was convinced that this this clearly is the place that I must be from and must return to and, and reclaim for, for my people, uh, which I thought was... A great way to just like yes and a, a, an offhanded comment yeah. from my yeah. character. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. I know, too. like I was. <clears throat> go ahead. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was gonna say I was definitely open to the yes and uh, until like the conversation started to turn to, and I think um, I very intentionally sort of locked on to what what you said in character, Jonathan, about like you know some people are more interested in the journey, and I was like, as a knowledge domain cleric, yes, that would make yeah. sense. So I was like, no, I'm not going to take this. This is not something that's going to interest Brina. Like, she's more in it for this this journey and this, like... <laughs> she's like, I'm not going to make a deal with this guy. It's, <laughs> and I not think, a good, uh, it's not a good plan. <laughs> no. And I think, uh, like, Athene playing a paladin, I don't know. I, I just felt like that was not... It wasn't her specific vibe the whole time. She's just this, like, person who bustles around and, um, you know, lets her dog do the thinking for her. Um, you were like, I'm spoken for. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know. Also, sometimes you just can't separate your characters. And when other characters of yours in the past have made deals with Asmodeus, you're like, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> I say from personal <laughs> experience. <laughs> sometimes you have that baggage and you're just not. You're not ready to do like it again. In another reality. Yeah, in another reality, I, would, I did this and it didn't go well. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, I have other yeah, characters was, who have definitely done that. Yeah. So bringing <laughs> Asmodeus in and having him make a deal made a little bit more sense of like why Volo was trapped there. Like he wanted to offer Volo a deal and so he kept him from leaving. Um, versus just like, here's the devil, y'all get out. Like, you know, trying to make, like, th that's one of those elements where the story does not really got to take creative license with what you're given to make a story that makes sense in a tabletop role. Mm -hmm. well, and I don't know how you feel about that. I'm going to take all the questions. Kayla doesn't need to ask any questions. <laughs> um, but I don't know how you feel about that from a GM perspective because basically it's you having a conversation with yourself in that respect. But, like, I think it was, you know, that was a really interesting ploy for us, too. And it was fun for me to play with. Like, hey, Volo, like, he's saying you're going to be in, like, medium comfort. That's not your style. Like, so it was fun to play off of that. Yeah. But, like, from a GM perspective, I also know, like, it can be weird when you're like, oh. I'm having this pivotal point happen, but it's me having a conversation with no, myself. It was 100% yeah. set up so that y'all would intervene. Like, yeah. if y'all had just been like, nah, this is Volo's business. We'll just sit back and see what he does. I would have been, I would have been real sad. <laughs> Um, so there's, so on that same note, y'all handled this really well, but when, so when I was thinking about fights and stuff, cause a lot of times my one shots, I really only go for like one battle, but I was like, this is hell. And there are literal monsters from the monster manual and D and D that show up. And so I was like, maybe they'll have at least a couple chances for a fight. And so y'all, y'all handled the chimera that showed up, which was um, really some creative license with the three creatures that are at the very beginning of the book and confront Dante. But um, the Medusa shows Thanks, up. Thanks, Athene. Uh, yeah, the, the Medusa <laughs> shows up. And um, that is a thing that Virgil has to cover Dante's eyes. And I was like, oh, this is great because we can do a battle, but it gives me a chance to have a side thing that you have to do because I think battles are more fun if it's not just... I can focus all of my attention on fighting something and that there's another concern. So I was going to make it if y'all stayed and y'all or y'all couldn't get over the wall and the, the Medusa actually arrived and y'all had to fight it. Volo really wanted to look at it. <laughs> and so you, if you didn't want him to get to turn to stone, you would have to actively <laughs> do stuff to make sure he didn't. Cause he was like, I've got to write this down. Um, but y'all turned, <laughs> turned the Medusa and the flies and ran up the wall and got out there real fast. So it didn't end up becoming an issue and it worked out. So we didn't run over time, but, um, that was another situation where it was like, I, Volo was there to force y'all to take care of Volo. Like he was a baby because that's how Virgil has to interact with Dante. So I was like, they were told to bring him out of here. So my guess is they're probably going to be like, Hey, Volo, maybe don't make this deal have to be a voice for him to stop him from doing something that his his dummy brain would be like sure i could get a lot of fame like from making this deal. <laughs> you don't you don't want that fame how many ascots <laughs> could i get for out of this deal <laughs> every color and, of the rainbow and i don't know how much of that is uh canonical like i definitely i am the game master for a game of water deep that did heavily feature volo and maybe i took some liberties i don't i don't remember how much of that is canonical how much he loves ascots the one in ours loves them a lot yeah. so uh <laughs> i mean i i like it you you Volo is one of those characters that's been in the game for a very long time, and he is what everyone mm -hmm. makes him. I mean, I think I've seen him show up in other modules. He's always sort of like that. Like, I don't know that anyone has like a truly flattering depiction of Volo. <laughs> so there's one more character. We, we mentioned uh, very early on the NPCs, and I want to ask y'all about um, mm -hmm. because... Um, so there was a devil at the gates of Dis who was, uh, loved to make fun of y'all. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ask this question and see. Is this a Monty is Python any, reference? It is 100% a Monty Python reference. <laughs> 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 I was gonna say. Yeah, it totally was. It totally was. <laughs> so, so I saw Chris Perkins do an Acquisitions Incorporated episode where he made two gargoyles be the two Muppets from the ones that sit up the Wilbur Statler. Yeah, Statler. Walter from Statler. And yeah. I was oh like, that's God. that's excellent. And then like later on, some point in time after that, I remember watching Monty Python and seeing that guy and I'd be like, he'd be a great NPC to bring into a Dungeons and Dragons. Just somebody who's on a wall, feels like they're untouchable, but is just really petty and wants to make fun of everybody <laughs> who can't get through. 
I almost like made the insult. Uh, your mother, your father was a hamster, and your mother smelled of elderberries. Isn't it that? Is that it? I forget. Yep. I think it's that's it. I was like, I almost <laughs> yep. said that to him, and then I was like, I don't think Athene would say that. Athene is not is not that funny. Oh yeah, um, I I got the reference, but Hibernos didn't understand. Not, not a reference. Yeah, didn't understand um, insults generally, and so. Uh, mm-hmm. Couldn't engage back. <laughs> I'm glad it came through, because uh, I was like, this may be one of the only like true moments of chance to have some genuine laughs that we have while we're in hell. Like, we had a lot of laughs. We there did end up. Yeah, I was surprised. Yeah. I, I give y'all I, for that. and that was a big concern, right? Yeah. As you were planning it, you wanted to build in some levity, and it, I think it worked. I did. Yeah. I did. I mean, I loved Griffin's attempt at like insulting that that devil back yeah. in oh, so character oh was just God. like so i loved it, funny. it was... i did so i did funny. talk with kayla about that leading up to it that i was worried all of my all the stories that i do for this show are like depressing <laughs> um and i was like i don't know i gotta do something to make make something you know have some chance for levity and enjoyment because um, cause Dante's Inferno, like there are moments that it's funny and it's part the trilogy is called the divine comedy. Um, but it is also like, I mean, it's harrowing. Like there are, there are a lot of topics in that book that I actively avoid. Like I, I thought of ways they could be incorporated, but I was like, I'm not going to touch. There is a whole area in hell that's called the tree, the forest of suicides or people who've committed suicide are turned into trees and stuff. It's a book that was written in like the 1300s or whatever. It doesn't always have a great sense of what should be punished and what not and, and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot in it that um, it hasn't aged well, I guess you could say. Um, yep. and, and would also make things a lot worse when it comes to like having moments of levity. Because, I mean, in addition to being... yeah hopefully a chance for us to explore some literature in new ways. I like to think that role of play has funny moments, just enjoyable as an entertainment source. And so like completely being, but I mean, you rely so much on the players to do that. And I was like, but I've got to give them cues. I've got to give them opportunities. I can't just rely on them to be funny and entertaining. I mean, it may just come down to how, who some of us are by nature, too. But, I mean, I think we, we all took opportunities to do that. I mean, yeah. Alice, that was quite the palate you <laughs> had there. I'm going to pick every fight I can because I'm a thief. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, no, not the game. I didn't pick every but fight. Also at this, but in character, I was like, oh, no, not again. But out of character, I was like, this is great. <laughs> Because what else is a paladin going to do in that kind of, like, situation? Like, you're a paladin. just going to be like, no, i got to fix all of this. A paladin in hell. Yeah. No, I mean, I was trying to yeah. think of, like, when I made her. I had a couple of ideas I was throwing around. Um, and I thought it was interesting. I was thinking about, like, okay, we're chasing or we're, like, following this deity of knowledge. But generally, Int is a dump stat for paladins. Uh, basically across the board. Wisdom sometimes a little bit less so, but I made it also a dump stat for Athene. So she had two. <laughs> so she was not particularly wise, not particularly intelligent. Um, and so I was like, what? Okay, but what if I, if I was playing a halfling? So that way I could ride on a blink dog, which has naturally a higher int and wisdom score. Uh, naturally, I think it's like a 10 and a, 10 and a 13 or something, like pretty high. Um yeah, high, way higher perception than Athene had, I think. Um, so that was funny. Um, and I was like, this, this will be funny. Um, this will be fun. And it also like makes sense that she's like, I'm not very intelligent, but I know my dog is. So like, I can just follow his, his guide on like intelligence stuff. You know, he knows what's going on. Well- and I kept right. laughing to myself because a couple points, like, I looked over Volo's shoulder to look at what he was writing, but then, like, Anthony went so far as to read and sign a non disclosure <laughs> agreement before that was looking so at good. the contents of this yeah. book. And I'm like, you could just, you could just, he's short, you can just. You could just pick him right. up and take it. <laughs> you can just look over his shoulder, you know, what are you signing? Well, I mean, Hibernos was raised by elves and was yeah. raised. To be mm-hmm. lawful and, and to yeah. follow mm-hmm. the rules, and there was. 
other than checking the contract to make sure that there was nothing untoward in it, uh, <laughs> perfectly reasonable to ask somebody to sign an agreement before revealing personal information. But but also course. a great great character to go along with. Oh, Bolo, so fun! It was like, yeah, they were so such. Well. You were like, oh, <laughs> they were so interestingly balanced because like you know. A wizard could definitely go so many different ways, and I thought that was a really like interesting and different route to go. So I also tried. No, I sharing. tried with Hibernos to make sure that I had him equipped with spells that would be useful in the setting, but that weren't the spells that everybody picks every time for wizards. Mm. Um, which is why I, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, everybody basically ends up with polymorph at some point, but uh, the like transmutation. Uh, where I turned material into a bridge for us. I forget what that one's called. Um, but fabricate. It, fabricate, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. The, things yeah. like that where I basically never see anybody ever use it. And and so I picked spells with that as a consideration of which spells do I not normally see? I'm going to mm -hmm. gravitate more towards those if I think that they could potentially be useful. Um, but then I really enjoyed, you know... Uh, polymorph but chose to polymorph again into forms that we don't normally see so i turned medusa into a swarm of flies um <laughs> because who would transform a creature into a swarm of flies but yeah it worked pretty well <laughs> it, it, it did great. it did it worked really well so something fascinating i learned yeah. while setting this up is that apparently volo is a wizard he is a low level wizard um according to huh official mm -hmm. D, D documents i did not make a character sheet for him because i'm playing him as completely incompetent uh and i was like that's up to y'all volo's not gonna help you at all if he did he was just gonna like light something on fire right, make things worse. <laughs> no we're already i'm surprised i don't list him. We don't need here. that i'm surprised i don't list him as a low-level bard yeah that was because that's what i had assumed yeah, that's he would true because he's got like the kind of vibe charisma vibe you know I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something I found out. So this was one of the games, maybe the game where we've had characters at the highest level so far, right? Um, yeah, level nine. Alice in Wonderland. Al Alice, Alice the, the, the sequel. To the Alice second Alice Looking Glass. The we did eleven. That was level for that. Yeah, eleven. Was the highest. That was the highest. So this was level nine. I think. And. How much going into the game were you told about the kind of scenario for you to prepare? How well do you feel like you made a character that matched the scenario that you ended up with? I know you were given a goddess mm -hmm. to follow in one way or another. I think we, we were told but, you're going to hell. You need to retrieve somebody <laughs> and bring them out. And I think that was oh, about yeah. it. And we were told build, yeah, we were told build a fifth level. Well, Alice and I came into the game planning a little later, so then we were told actually make it ninth level, and then we were all like, oh. So I mean, like I I built a character that I think was good for the scenario. The problem was I've only played a cleric once before in a one shot, and I'm still getting the hang of it. So I feel like I probably didn't play it as effectively as I could. I was too hesitant. I was holding back on using spells. Um, and doing some stuff like so I feel like the RP was great maybe I didn't fight as well as I could have um, mm. yet but I liked what I built <laughs> and I think it worked it just was more on me to like figure out how to do that <laughs> yeah. I took it as an opportunity to use some of the newer rules uh, that allowed for mm. changing um, origin so that I could play a Goliath that would have um, kind of the necessary attributes to be able to be a wizard um, and so I wanted to try, uh, basically the entire build for this character was to try things that were somewhat unusual and see how they worked. And I actually really enjoyed playing a Goliath wizard. Um, Order of Scribes was also a new subclass and one that I quite enjoyed playing with basically having your familiar be your spell book and being able to send it mm, out yeah, to fly around mechanic. and it could cast spells for me and... Um, so it's definitely a character that I would be interested in, in de-leveling de and actually using in a long-term campaign um, at some point. 
this is the from Tasha's Cauldron it's... of Everything, right? Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. updated rules. That, that origin thing? Yeah. 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 I just wanted to reference that. I can I'll post a link. Yeah, I will say, like, jumping into a ninth level cleric, having only once before played a fifth level, I was like, whoa, there is too much going on here. <laughs> and I think that's a, that's a, a, maybe not a trap, but that's one of the, the tricks of the one shot, is like, if you've never yeah. played something and you want to try it for the first time, that can be great, but it can also be like, whoa, there's a lot to understand mechanics-wise about a character, and you may not be able to yeah. master all of it. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, I've never played a wizard in a long-term campaign so i've never had uh, all the magic users that i play just have spells prepared i've never had to just choose spells or choose which ones i'm going to prepare that day or um and because this was was a one shot i didn't experience that here either um <clears throat> so that's yet to yet to be something that i need to to do um because i basically played sorcerers because uh, then I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so for some context, too, because y'all yeah. mentioned that you started off at fifth level and then I later came back and told you to go. So the Chimera and the Medusa are both like challenge rating eight. And when I threw in the fact that Volo was there and you would need to protect him and his uh, idiot self uh, from getting murdered, I was like, those could be a little dangerous for players. Um, especially like y'all said, just being thrown into a character with a lot of stuff. And so I was like, even the, the, uh, hit point, you'd be at it pretty, pretty dangerous challenge, challenge rating eight. And then when I decided later that you were going to also end up in the eighth cir- circle with the Malabronque, um, which are directly from mm. Dante's Inferno, like <laughs> there are devils in fifth edition in the monster manual that are named for the devils in uh, Dante's Inferno from the same level and they're designed to be the same why they have sharp talons and they carry large tridents Um, and so those are challenge rating 13 and there's going to be a lot of those Uh, and I was like hmm yeah I mean hopefully they won't just attack them like so in the <laughs> in the in the book they this basically the same thing happened they are like hey we're just traveling and and the leader of the malabranche is like okay like that's fine we'll the bridge is out we'll send a, a escort with and dante and virgil realize that they're planning to do something and that this is and so they are they're trying to brainstorm some way of tricking them and eventually they, they, they actually get the distraction in the form of the people in the, that are in the pit the, uh, who are being punished. Like, I think Dante's talking to one of them and they, they come over to like stab this guy and get him out of the, like get him back into the pit and they take their opportunity. Um, and so that situation, I was, I was like, this is a good challenge because it's not a challenge you can fight, but it's still sort of something you have to think about. And so literally the wind mechanic was just like, find a way to distract them from you and you can run away. Um, and so I was just like, <laughs> whatever. I mean, or you can try to fight them, but it really isn't great because they're child drag 13 and there's like 30 of them. Um, I don't think any of us wanted to fight them. We were like, oh, no, we're figuring that's, that's good. That's this a good decision. <laughs> the only thing, um, I was Oath of the Ancients, uh, which I had taken, because it made the most sense with sort of the knowledge domain kind of stuff. Um, and so I turned the Faithless, so I could make any, like, within 30 feet of us, I could make people, like, fiends run away, potentially, if they didn't make their wisdom saves. Um, which, I don't know, I was like, I was concerned that they would make their wisdom saves. Um, you know... A lot of fiends and there were like 30 of them right I, <laughs> they weren't lot. all within 30 feet of you we were still gonna be in yeah i was just hoping we could de- like deter enough of them so we could get away if we needed to uh, but i was not about to fight once we ran away that was when we ended up on the slope where we were sliding down and we had to make the choice of going in the hole or not what was what would have happened if we had made the mm, wrong choice? If wrong I had choice, failed yeah. on that perception, or if if my book had failed on that perception, and I had not been able to call out and have us all go in the hole, uh, you would have been falling um, into the ninth circle. Uh, 
So oh. you would have needed to figure out some means of dealing with that because it's a long fall. So, I mean, either take the fall damage, which was pretty significant, or find some other magical means of getting other fall, whatever it is, to, to prevent the fall. <laughs> but, yes, that was just a bare cliff to fall. The other one was like a sliding path down that would slide you out on the hurling stone. Mm. That would have been bad. Uh, I'm just gonna throw it out yeah, there. It would, yeah, it would have. I <laughs> yeah. I had a couple spells that potentially would have worked, but I did not take Featherfall. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I wouldn't have had anything to get us out of that. I, yeah. I could have tried polymorphing one of us. I could have tried like Thunder Step to <laughs> like link to the bottom, but nothing that would have worked for all of us. You know, if there was plants available, I could have done plant growth and maybe made like a little soft cushion to cushion our fall. You mean with all those plants in the in, in the, the frozen yeah. in the frozen water? We yeah. Yeah, I don't know how that would have worked. Yeah. Um probably not. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think I had anything. I would have just taken the fall damage. I did have revivify. <laughs> yeah, two of us had it's revivify. Good to have. Well, I guess I mean, it's a good of, thing uh, I had my book cuz it's yeah. what some, it's what yeah. made the perception check. I failed. That was very clever, too. I was like, go for it. I mean, like, some of you probably could have, like, the paladin probably could have survived the fall from the fall damage. Um, some of you might have gone down. You might. I was already down half my oh, yeah, hit points gone, from the fight from down. early on. Yeah. I took a, he a heavy hit, so I never would have survived the fall. But to be clear, was, it probably would have killed me flat out. When, like, when I designed that, I did not, I had no clue what your spells were. And quite honestly, even if I had the opportunity to look at them, I wouldn't look at them. I was just like, yeah. this is the mm -hmm. this is the situation. Yeah. They'll have to figure out something. They got two op. They got an easier option if they like can make a save. Dependent because I was like, I don't know who's going to end up with the map, like. I don't know who's going to get it, but mm -hmm. that person hopefully will be able to you know, be very perceptive and check things because it will be difficult as you're sliding down the side of a hill to read about. It. <laughs> sure. It worked out. Um, we all live. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, y'all actually <laughs> overcame a lot of the challenges. It probably, did, which I think is a testament. <laughs> Yeah. Were there any of the challenges or conflicts that you would have done differently now being able to look at it in hindsight? Um probably the gate, the the, the walls of disc. I'm talking oh, Are you talking to me? <laughs> I, was, I was asking the players. I mean, oh honestly, my God. you can I was you can I think really about really just wanted to be able to press to digitate all of the people in the um cesspools clean. Like I, that, mm, that's all that's I wanted fair. from that. I just wanted to be able to use magic to to magically clean those cesspools, um, so that they weren't <laughs> wallowing in um, muck. Yeah, yeah. I could use other words to that's actually fair. describe what they actually were wallowing in, but I, I think the point got across. <laughs> uh, yeah. I felt like overall. I managed things in the way that Athene would have done, which was sometimes not the most straightforward or useful ways, such as the wallet dis. Mm. Um, I forget. I think I had tried to like throw a spear with a rope up there, like mm -hmm. without having a grappling <laughs> hook. That seems like sh something she would do, um, <laughs> you know, which clearly worked about as well as you'd expect. Um, man, walls. <laughs> walls are always challenging yeah. for characters in this, in this game. Walls and doors, you know. Walls and doors, yeah. Those are the ones that yeah. get you. The, the wall at Dis reminded me a little bit of the gate, the gates of Oz in The Wizard of Oz. Yes! Mm -hmm. um, that also... It, it felt very much like that. Um, it also, of course, reminded me of uh, the wall that we had to get past that Humpty Dumpty was sitting on in Through the Looking Glass. <laughs> so... Jonathan likes walls. Everyone who's going to play a future session, note that. I and mean, there was some very sure, similar just, vibes, yeah. too. It's just, like, a, I mean, walls guards. are a basic barrier. And they're also, like, an easy thing for your, like, for, like, a success mechanic. 
Like, here's a wall. You just got to get by it. Like, whatever means, but, like, you have at your disposal. But just getting by a 200-foot mm -hmm. wall that is, you right. know... I mean, I definitely got stuck in... I was having some technical difficulties at that point in the game, too. But I, I got stuck in my own head trying to solve this wall. I was like, how do... We, like, it's just a wall, but it's, like, 200 feet high, and we don't have anything to climb it, and we none of us have any way to, like, fly, and, like... There's no gate around here, and even if there is, it's going to be guarded. Like, I got real stuck in my head oh, on that wall. Yeah. We could have flown, and I could have blinked through it, but it would have just been me. And getting the others through was a concern, and we didn't know what was on the other side, and we didn't know how the demons would react if we just passed the wall. Mm. Um, so uh, uh, my character, Hibernos, being um, somewhat concerned with paying attention to the laws and and doing as is expected uh that wasn't really an option i mean it's the same sort of situation i i didn't know what spells you had I didn't know who was going to be what i was just like here's a wall they could fly over it they could pass wall they could meld stone they could dig underneath of it they could go through this opening they could spider climb like any of these things are valid, like, <laughs> methods of getting over and it. None of those and none things. of those things, like, turned out to be, <laughs> yeah, like, available to you. I had legend lore. I could have tried to figure out what I knew about <laughs> that wall and how to get around it. I mean, I tried suggestion or command suggestion. Mm -hmm. I was so excited about that idea that I had, and it just, like, did not work. And I was like, no! <laughs> Yeah, that was like, a. I'm gonna convince this demon to do exactly what I want. Ill. That was an in Inris. I don't know how to actually say it. It's a it's a character from Five E. They're a devil that is looks like a human in like beautiful armor. They're they're probably some of the closest devils to like fallen angels, which is the mythos in Faerun about all the devils are um, solars. They're angelic creatures that fell and are. I mean, similar the way they are actually in a Western mythos. Um, and became the devils. And these are sort of the ones that are still like the closest to it. And um, a big reason why I made y'all do the wall is because the wall is a big deal in Dante's Inferno. Um, that mm -hmm. is that is the one place where, like the first place where Virgil takes Dante and he goes, hey, we got passage on high. We get to go through here. And they go, no, we don't care. You're stuck out there. Um <laughs> And he has to, like, they have to stop and it, like, just call, grinds their journey to a halt. And they have to sort of try to figure something else. Um, because there, there's an initial rebelliousness that comes up. Just don't know. Accurate. To our experience. Like, we had a very similar. Year. No, it was, it was good trying to think of anything else no i think most of the other things we went through pretty quickly that was like the only thing that took like mm -hmm. a period of time everything else i think we like kind of almost sped through like other issues except for like having to yeah. convince our own players or volo like no no we have to go get on this boat now everyone over this <laughs> way <laughs> stop talking to the de i know i told you to talk to the dead people now i need you to stop talking to the dead people and come with me yeah yeah, we, we managed to get a rest in at the cesspools, right? Yeah, short rest, I think. Yeah. Short rest, because mm -hmm. that was when Volo got into the fist fight. Yeah. Or almost got into the fist fight. Yes. Yeah. I'm back. Yes. Oh, yeah. that was when he wanted us to go away, and we were like, mm, we're, we're not, not leaving, leaving you. here by yourself. Yeah. That's not how no. this works. <laughs> well, no. and so not. me having signed the non-disclosure agreement allowed yes. me to stay with him because he wouldn't let anybody else yep. stay near but because I had signed the agreement he let me stay that was also I was like I mean it was it was a clever character thing to sign the agreement so yeah sure you can stay <laughs> oh man uh, we do have mowing happening right outside now so mm. hopefully it won't be picked up but just if you hear it that's what it is. At first, I thought it was like a plane outside my my place because sometimes I get like yeah, planes at the, there's, the campus airport. There's mowing happening outside here too, so I keep I keep muting. It's that time of year. <laughs> yep, we've all got perfect. <laughs> yeah, perfect timing. Oh me. Um, let's see here. 
So this, we've had several sessions in um, role of play that were based in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, uh, like this one was. Um, so we've definitely talked about kind of general experience with that before. Y'all have said that many of these character classes were classes that you have not played before or have not played at this level before. Um, was there anything in kind of taking on a new character, especially at a higher level, anything in particular that you thought would be really great and be really useful and then just was not useful whatsoever or something that you were like, maybe this will be useful, I don't know, and then it was clutch? Any like moments of realization? So going into this, I gave myself uh Proficiency in religion. My religion score was plus nine. I don't think we rolled a single religion check in the entire session, mm. but because it was Dante's Inferno, I thought that that would be an important skill. Um, and See, yeah. I took religion, but I also took history for the same reason, and that did come in handy, I think, at at least one point. So I was glad for that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, like, the knowledge domain clerics they get access, you know, the, the spells that they have in the long run. I thought, oh yeah, these will be great. It's like legend lore. Like, like what, I'm going to use my one fourth level spell slot casting legend lore down here? I don't know. Maybe I am. Uh, I know Alice and I were like scheming the night, the, you know, working on our characters and trying to figure out how they might complement each other in different ways. But um, I, like I said, I ended up not using a lot of spells and the things that I thought would be clutch were not in the end clutch. Like that command failure was just like, oh, okay, well that's mm -hmm. not going to work. Um. <laughs> I had taken Phantom Steed thinking that there might be an opportunity for that. Oh. Um, and that it just never came up. Um, the only person who needed to ride anything was Alice's character. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I had, I had gone back and forth. I had also thought about playing a Triton uh, paladin still like generally mounted and potentially on a giant lizard who would essentially have spider climb which is a thing that you can kind of put into uh, giant lizard mounts which could have been which would have been super useful had I gone that yes. route I could have spider climbed on and that that character would have been a lot more like I would have invested more in like wisdom and she would have been like a little bit smarter I had a whole I had a whole thing for her um she didn't happen. Athene happened. Because I was concerned. I remember I was talking because there were several people considering rogues at various points. Or, like, even Griffin was yeah. originally considering a rogue, like, a multi-class. Yep. And I was like, oh, well, then we don't have to be stealthy. And then everyone went off of rogue. And I'm like, we have no one or nothing that can be <laughs> stealthy. And actually, I think uh, Blink Dogs have a proficiency in stealth. Uh, so... Orion had like a plus six to stealth, and I had a um, disadvantage plus one. Yep. So I was like, you know, this could be useful if we need <laughs> something to scout ahead. I don't think we ended up using him that way. We definitely did have some stealth rolls though, and he succeeded on them. So I don't know. I there was a couple of other things. <laughs> Athletics came in I was handy. Say, also, just I was so excited <laughs> to use the arcane quill where I could write something and then just wave my <laughs> hand over it and have the writing disappear. And then uh, we just kept getting close to where that would be useful. And then we would move off some other way. And I never really got to use it. I was going to say, I took, I, I, this is hilarious. Like the more I think about it and, and leading up to it, I thought, I know what I'll take. I took speak with dead. I don't know what I was expecting or what I thought we might run into where we wouldn't be able to speak to all of the dead people who were already in hell. I was like, what? It, it, like later on, I was like, why did I take that spell? Who were we going to run into that wasn't going to be willing to talk to us unless I had speak with dead? I mean, you did but, run into a lot of dead people, though. But part of my brain was like, maybe <laughs> we would have to use it in some weird set of circumstances. What if we have to communicate with somebody and that's the only way to do it? I that don't know. same thing happened in the Alice in Wonderland game where oh, yeah. one of us had speak with plants. It was um, me. It was but me. We were in the Feywild and all the plants just talked to us. <laughs> yeah, I used my like I had like at the time we were doing fifth level characters, I was like, fine, I'm using my third my only third level spell to give them sunshine. They get sunshine now. <laughs> I was grumpy about it. It was like at the last fifteen minutes of the campaign. <laughs> I'm all 
always ruining y'all's <laughs> carefully wrought plans. Hey, I did use that guidance though. Bang bang! Everybody, yeah. gets everybody guidance gets guidance, guidance all the time. Best spell I mean, ever. Guidance all the time. In the case of the quill, like that probably would have yeah. worked, but really just giving them a contract was enough to distract them. Yeah. Like. They're devils. They love contracts, and they're gonna like. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. heavy within the lore of D and D about devils. They're all lawful. They love contracts and going over them. And like, if y'all had just decided to stick around, like you could have done that. But it was also like they're very distracted right now. So if y'all just want to leave, you can. Yeah. <laughs> Always a good decision. Yeah. Kitty. I mean, it worked out, right? It worked out. Ollie. Um, Ollie's joining us. We love this. We love this. Yeah. Ronan already joined us. I don't know if he's still mm -hmm. there. I did see a little Ronan head pop so up. So I know it was mentioned yeah. earlier, but um, it, it seems like just from popular media and other sources, people are familiar with Inferno. Uh, but you mentioned um, Purgatorio and Paradiso, and I would be very interested in hearing a little bit about those and whether you yeah. had any thoughts of what they would look like as one shots i think you mentioned that you had thought about that but like what are you still considering those as potential things to run or things like that they're challenging so i think i could make them work <laughs> in just bringing them in the fifth edition because of the the plane system that exists in D, &D. um and Basically, you could sort of keep with a theme, but um, just have fun somewhere more interesting. Like Purgatorio, basically, like at the end of Inferno, they, they come out the other side of the world, and they come out at the base of a large mountain. And the mountain is Purgatorio, and Purgatorio is where people who uh, weren't bad enough to go to hell, but also weren't good enough to go to heaven go which is not a thing that has transferred into modern conception. It's much, very much a binary black and white. Purgatorio was a place. A medium place. Yeah, it's a medium place. Uh, you've watched The Good Place. Um, there, so per Shout out to The Good Place. So there are, there are souls that are just <laughs> climbing Purgatorio and have been climbing it for a very, very long time. And the concept is like not as interesting. There's not all these like strange punishments and, and creatures like that. Um, the one of the concepts that's there and would probably be what I would have to play with is if a if a mortal living person prays for one of the peep the souls that is on Purgatorio, they basically get like a boost. Um, so they're like carried oh. slightly up the mountain. It, 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 in Axe itself, I think they become lighter and they can just sort of like jump up the side of this mountain a little bit. And so they get like this weird little boost. But when they get to the top, they are supposed to go to, to paradise. And they're all sort of like weighed down by the things they did in life. So it's much harder for some of them to climb than others. It, that one is probably the most challenging one to convert because you, uh, the, the neutral planes as they exist in 5e are very different than like that concept like the neutral planes are like yeah. where mechanists with like the modrons are and and stuff and you could probably come up with something but it'd probably have to be pretty heavily metaphorical in terms of its relation and then paradiso is basically like a journey through all of heaven and you get to see all the great people and um, meet angels and um, all this sort of stuff which you could do in like celestia and all these other planes um those two books just have never had the cultural impact that Inferno has had. And so while I thought about it, and I think I even joked back and forth with Kira on multiple occasions about like converting the other two books to it, they would be a challenge that I would have to go back and visit those books to figure out like, like with the Inferno, I was like, you know, I'm going to go back and look at some details, but I know this book well enough that I'm like, I could probably just like one shot those I'm like this would be a challenge and it would how much it would resemble the original work would be difficult to a certain degree I feel like you could turn mm -hmm. Purgatorio into like a sort of survivalist challenge it would be much more like how do I literally climb this mountain and survive mm -hmm. like how do we literally survive yeah. climbing this mountain um, it'd be more like the open boat 
it would be more like, I down, mean, yeah, you, you could know. treat it more like that, though. Yeah. It's like, how do we do this? And maybe to the betterment of others, to, to that point you made about, you know, bringing people up with you. If the goal is, how do I bring people up with me and how do I do that? You know, how can I get as many people as possible? You could cre- treat it kind of like a survivalist thing there. I mean, personally, I know this question wasn't aimed at me, but like Paradiso, there just aren't as many challenges. No, it's no. not, it's not, I hate to put it this way, but like, like Johnson said, we've talked about this more. It's just not fun. It's actually, to I think, to me, the most boring of the trilogy because it's just not. I, there aren't the planes themselves, the outer planes that represent that in D&D are really interesting and there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with them. But the storyline itself of Paradiso there's some great stuff that comes out of it there's some great poetry around relationships and things like that that come also out of that work later on in art and things like that but i don't know how fun of an adventure it would be (laughs) that's the challenge is like there are some works when we, we made our big spreadsheet that i'm like the adventure is obvious and there were ones where i was like mm-hmm. the adventure is not obvious but the adventure is there and it's going to take some molding and then there are a few things that i put on there that i'm like I got no clue, but I think it would be cool, and I'm going to put it on here anyways. <laughs> um, I definitely think Paradiso is in that realm of like books that I would have pulled off the shelf and been like, I I got nothing immediately occurring to me because they're like it's it's not a place of conflict, like and and adventures are based right. in that conflict, um, and so like. It's, it would be it would be hard but you would have to introduce conflict so yeah. like uh, mm-hmm. if you've ever seen Diablo 3 where you end up in heaven and you're there because the demons have invaded heaven from hell uh, and and so you go to paradise but either yeah. the angels are corrupt or demons have invaded and that's that's what happens yeah. in paradise when you put a player character there typically yeah and, but the question is, at like a certain point, is this still Paradiso? Like, or is this just a story I made up about how demons have made it? Yeah, I think you'd have to do a lot to get it yeah. there and to the point where it might not be recognizable anymore, except if you keyed into some like specific elements and sort of drag them through that as a through line. Yeah. Well, so something I did want to... And if anyone in our audience is interested <laughs> in putting the effort in to do that work... You definitely can. If you have suggestions, we would love to hear those. Uh, but also, if you are part of the Virginia Tech community or part of libraries or part of the New River Valley area, and you want to run a one-shot based on Paradiso or something else, you should oh reach boy, out to do us we have an offer for at uh, bit.ly. <laughs> right? Bit.ly forward slash role of play, where role <laughs> and play are capitalized, or role of play dash g at vt dot edu or yeah yeah that's so right. some, then you something i thought this, of and i want to so. mention it while it's still on my mind because you mentioned purgatorio as like an option and as a survivalist game when you mentioned it as like a survivalist game i immediately thought isn't the game video game celeste just purgatorio it is the story of a person climbing a mountain in order to like become a better person like explicitly my goal is to become a better person um, spoilers, and like facing their spoilers. own. <laughs> they literally, she says that like the first line no, of the game yeah, is like, true. I got to climb this mountain cause I don't like who I am or something like that. It's, but, um, <laughs> like, and it's fighting your own, like who you are as a person sort of thing. And I was like, we always get to the question of like other media that is sort of similar or influenced mm-hmm. by and stuff like that. And I was immediately like, I never made yeah. that connection before. I would have never, because I don't think about Purgatorio as like an influence on like a media in the same fashion that I would think of Inferno. But I mean, there it is. I was trying to think of a mechanic for the prayers to provide boons. And yeah. I was, mm-hmm. I was thinking of the hunger games where the little um, parachute <laughs> things yeah. come in the gifts from the viewers uh. <laughs> oh, I would make it. I would make it so chat it on that Twitch. That would be cool. Uh, if, oh, they yeah. pray, if they prayed for y'all, y'all yeah, yeah, yeah. Got, got a boost. <laughs> yeah, that that'd would be, be so good. That'd be really good. Oh, oh, um, that'd be so fun. Yeah, I mean, audience, if you want to see it, you let us know. Should we try you to can. do uh, Purgatorio as a dad land? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> that's the thing. To escape oh. the post-apocalyptic world. I think <laughs> sort of. 
in between worlds. There's also the I was trying I've been looking into the Ryutama system, uh, which is a Japanese. It's described as Oregon Trail Ooh. meets Studio Ghibli. Um, Ghibli. Um, <laughs> Which interesting. <laughs> I'm down for this. Which I feel like may also be um, maybe like a system that might work for it. I think there's a number of systems with like a few more survival mechanics because that's not as big of a component of Dungeons and Dragons. Like because combat is so much more, mm-hmm. you know, emphasized. And so, right. prob- I would say finding some sort of uh, TTRPG that has more of a survival mechanic built in, I think, would be useful to. Deadlands has some of that. Yeah. Too, yeah. for like the literally being wounded sort of survival. Just system. reskin paranoia. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Another yes. option. Yeah. So, another thing that comes to mind if we're thinking about like adaptations and stuff, um, there is a mm-hmm. modern book that's called Gehenna that is just retelling da- Dante's Inferno, but all of the punishments have been like modernized. Um, and so, like, I remember one of the first punishments that the character comes, the new Dante comes across is, like, people who are just given a television and food, and they just sit and eat food in front of the television until, like, they grow so, like, fat and bloated that they can't get up anymore. Um, Isn't that Wally? <laughs> it is kind of Wally. <laughs> Seven? Yeah, it's a lot of things. Old. Oh. Um, but like they, it goes through like all the le- all the, the circles of hell as Dante depicts them, and they talk the like the devils talk about what they've done to adapt to the times, and like who they've like who they're punishing now and why and all this sort of stuff and it's it's basically sort of like a modern retelling of that. But it was it was a fascinating read. It's not nearly as long as Dante's Inferno, and is ri- I don't it's not I don't believe it's poetry either. It's written as prose. So uh, everything with Dante's Inferno that we've talked about, the descriptions of it, all of the references, m- the the place that I know all of this from is Incarnations of Immortality from Piers Anthony, um, that series. Um, and I think particularly the Being a Green Mother book and uh, For Love of Evil. Um, those are the two that I think uh, deal the most with hell um, and... and the depictions therein but like all of this sounds really familiar because it's it's all in there but it's all done with humor um uh, so i if anybody's looking for a humorous sort of uh sci-fi fantasy um exploration of this i would highly recommend pierce anthony's incarnations of immortality and now i have to stop myself from thinking of uh elements of that series to turn into one shot or keep going <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In case you aren't aware of it, I've already started stuff for like the fall semester. I already put something on the list for fall. We don't even have a list. Yeah, yet. I don't Kayla, think, I think we've. Um... Kayla, I am. I am. I just noticed you talking. It's just the... so loud outside. <laughs> oh, it's not too <laughs> it's bad. Just I so think. loud outside. I was gonna say um, real fast. We have. Yeah. Are there other? Go oh, ahead. I was just saying we haven't necessarily announced this, but like. Season one, the main season of Roll of Play will end. I don't have the date on me. This would, I should have started looking for the date before I started saying this sentence and this information. It's the second, in May. second Friday in the May. The second Friday in May will be the last, the the season finale. I think it's the ninth. I think that's. I should know because I'm running a game, but or the seventh or the ninth. The seventh not the right day. is the first Friday. Oh, then it's in, the first Friday because it's the seventh. We're ending yes. with the Sherlock Holmes game, right? We are yeah. ending unless somebody's throwing something after that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I believe it'll end at the seventh, yeah. which is I think the last like Friday within our sort of every other week time frame in in the semester for Virginia Tech. But we'll be back in the fall mm-hmm. and over the summer. We'll have some special role of play content. Tbh. Um, uh, no, TBD. That's, that's TBD. the one. <laughs> to be honest. Well, like, to be honest, we're going to have some stuff. It's really, it's really more... Right, TBH, it's TBD. TBH. So, TBH, TBH. It's, TBD. it's actually, I think it's... And TBA. Yeah. It'll be to be determined and to be announced. I think it's mostly just that's TBA. Right. I think we've mostly thought of it. There's some ideas. Times yeah. ETA TBD. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. Oh, oh gosh. Um, yeah. Yay. Um, TMA. 
But we do have... Too many have... acronyms. <laughs> we do... <laughs> TMI? Too much? <laughs> oh, my gosh. We do have two games left, right? Two, yes. This semester, though. Two, yes. Um, which will be both uh, run by Kira. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. It's going to be an adventurous few weeks. <laughs> Uh, do you want to sure. tell us about the yeah, games that so, are coming up? Uh, coming up next Friday, April 23rd. I'm hoping someone can... Yes, 23rd, because I, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but we just determined the yes. 7th. Uh, so next Friday, April 23rd, here on the Twitch channel at 6 p.m., I will be running a Honey Heist based on The Hobbit. So all of you Tolkien fans out there, we are going to go on a weird exploration. Uh, Jonathan has already asked me if he could play Gollum, and I said no because I was going to upset the whole the whole ideas that all of the ideas that I have. You always let me have fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do always. Uh, and then two weeks after that, on May seventh, we will be doing a part two of our the adventures of the artifact heist. So the Sherlock part one that we well the Sherlock that we did a few weeks ago, however long ago it was, uh, we are going to do a part two of that adventure with some recurring players from our first adventure and some new players so i think that mm. works really well with the storyline that i crafted uh that we can bring some recurring people back and bring some new people in and see where the rest of that adventure goes because there are still some objects to be found and some many questions to be answered both very <laughs> exciting and coming up here directly yeah uh, other things that we have coming up here directly uh, include Game Night, yes. the University Libraries of Virginia Tech. Uh, and if anyone has a link handy to put the calendar event in the chat on Twitch, um, it is fully online again this year or this semester. Uh, we had a fully online event for the fall. Uh, in the before times, it was an in-person event, which was also open to uh, our community. Uh, but for this semester, we are again going to be keeping things online. Uh, we will have several one-shot adventures that you could participate in, uh, in a variety of, um, uh, why can't, plat not platforms the thing like Dungeons and Dragons or game systems Alice is missing <laughs> yes thank you my brain was like mm -mm, we don't have that word now uh, game systems yeah yes. so we've got um, what is it eyes unclouded yeah. is that the one that you're leading Jonathan yeah, so I'm gonna um, so eyes unclouded is a um, it's a book that came I was posted on the DMs Guild it's a um, supplement for the D&D 5e edition that is based on the Studio Ghibli series of uh, movies from Japanese animator Hao Miyazaki. Uh, so there's a series of one shots that um, include stories and are influenced by that sort of Ghibli aesthetic a lot and I'll run a one shot from that. Uh, I know yeah. I, will be, I will be premiering my first ever Dadlands campaign um, which will not is not themed in literature, but um, some uh, some dads of all across the gender spectrum may be going on a hunt for the remote control, which the sports dad dads have absconded with. They keep wanting to watch some sort of reruns for something called the Superb Owl. Uh, mm. Dadlands, for those of you who don't know, is run in a post-apocalypse world, so <laughs> that is why some things maybe don't make sense anymore if they've gotten lost over time. <laughs> that works. And we are anticipating offering a session of kind of introductory information for creating your first Dungeons & Dragons 5e character and then uh, doing um, one or two kind of small encounters with them so you can kind of get a feel for what it's like being on this side of things. Uh, and then I will be running a game of Alice is Missing, uh, which is a uh, role-playing game where you don't talk. It's all based in text message, and you assume the role of one of Alice's friends, and you have to find it's out what so happened. Uh, it, it's so it, good. It's so great. Yeah, can attest. It's really, it's a, a Alice very recommends Alice interesting. Is Missing. Yes, absolutely, 2,000%. <laughs> Are you going to be using Roll20 for that, or...? <laughs> Uh, we're going to be using Discord. 
Um, and the art is gorgeous. Hashtag not sponsored. The music is so good, too. Not, not the interested. The music is so, so good. Are the new characters out? Oh, I haven't oh. seen. If they are, we'll you, should, look. Uh, you should look into making them an option. That's true. It is by default limited to five folks. So if you're interested in this... Uh, definitely sign up and register um, for that. Yeah, same role for Deadlands. We would Deadlands. love to offer it. We're doing five, and I don't know if Jonathan has a limit on his game, so some of the RPGs may be limited, but all of the other events should be pretty widely open and available for people to join us. And if you just want to come play some so, games. It, okay. Yeah, in addition to the role-playing games, there will be other games. Digital board games. Video uh, games. Come, yeah, collaborative and competitive come video play games. Come some Among Us. Check out Airship. Yeah. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I haven't haven't checked out that new map mm-hmm. yet. We'll need to do that. So, yeah, a lot of exciting stuff happening um, the University of Libraries of Virginia Tech. Um, and we're, we're a little past 6.30, uh, so I'm going to invite you viewers to share with us if you have any... Uh, suggestions, uh, any uh, comments on the channel in general, if you have anything that you think this is the perfect story for someone to adapt into a one shot. We want to hear about it. Uh, and you can let us know at roleofplay g at vt.edu. Uh, and you can also follow the bit.ly link in the uh, chat uh, to uh, express your interest otherwise. Um, and thank you for being here and thank all of you our, our players and our game master for chatting and for uh, you know being generally awesome we, does anybody else have anything they want to plug or we I think we'll raid uh, NCSU yeah. libraries um, okay. they're, they're working on some tilt brush cool stuff uh, so Ooh. it's excited to see especially since we had some cool AR VR things happening earlier today just continue on that push. Right. So uh, please join yeah. us rating them. And yeah, we'll see you all later. All right. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.